His Excellency, the Governor of Aruba, Chairman of the Aruban Parliament and colleagues, Her Excellency, the Prime Minister of Aruba, the Honorable President of the Central Bank of Aruba, and the Attorney General, distinguished members of the different organizations, commercial unions, NGOs, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, in the name of the University of Aruba and the Foundation for Quality Governments in Aruba, we welcome you all to this special event. We are very glad that you all joined us in this quest for the road for good governance. Thank you very much. Tonight we have invited the leaders of our most important institutions to share their vision and ideas with the Arubian community. The choice for them was not an accidental one. Of course, it has to do with the serious situation of Aruba. But however, tonight we shall not dwell on the causes, but rather focus on a necessary change of our political tradition. One of those traditions was the consistent neglect of the warnings, the opinions, and the recommendations of all national and international advisory and controlling institutions like the Socio-Economic Council, the Advisory Board, the Audit Office, the International Monetary Fund, and even the CAFT. For a time, that give the impression that our governments were much smarter than all these institutions. Yet the results gave a more realistic image. Some time ago, I stumbled upon a most interesting report of the Central Bank of Aruba. It's titled, A Roadmap to Sustainable Public Finances, 2013-2017. I was deeply impressed about the professional way it was set up, taking its warnings seriously and executing only 25% of its recommendations would already do miracles for Aruba. But again, unfortunately, it disappeared in a government's drawer. And I thought this should not be possible to keep these kinds of excellent documents out of the sight of the general public who, after all, pay all the bills. So I approached the president of the Central Bank of Aruba to ask her if she would be willing to give some insight to the Arubian community about the warnings and the recommendations to improve the state of Aruba. And as you have noticed, she was very willing to do so. May I present to you the first female president of a central bank in the Dutch Kingdom, Mrs. Jeanette Simelier. Excellencies, members of parliament, other special guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you. First of all, allow me to thank the Fundación Gobernación de Calidad Aruba for inviting me to be one of the speakers tonight. Secondly, I sincerely congratulate its founders for organizing this important symposium, the second one on the topic of the road to good governance. In my opinion, this is a huge accomplishment. I know it is very challenging to organize a symposium on good governance, even though it is a topic we talk about every day as it impacts the quality of our lives and decisions we make. Good governance and public sector management seem to be a contradictory in terminus in our country. And at the moment, it appears to remain an illusionary goal 
and something of the far future. It looks like a long and difficult road, ladies and gentlemen. So Armand, I don't know how many more symposia you need to organize <laughs> before the rubber hits the road that not only you, but many others so much have written about and spoken of. Hopefully through these types of forums, by facilitating public discussions and possibly solutions, fresh aspirations and new convictions for a better Aruba would lead to concrete actions to bring public sector management in alignment with international best practices in the area of good governance and fighting corruption. One of the main concerns of the central banks is the accomplishment and maintenance of sustainable government finances. This is also the case for the Central Bank Panoruba. Why are we worried about the government's financial position and whether it is sustainable or not? The answer is simple. It impacts the sustainability of the fluorine fixed exchange rate regime as well as the government's position as a credible borrower. To maintain confidence in the fluorine, the CBA targets levels of the foreign exchange reserves that are at any time available for covering transactions with non-residents. It is quite a complex issue, but I will try to explain it in a very simple way. Besides the CBA and the commercial banks via credit, the government of Aruba has the ability to create florins via the issuance of debt. Excessive government spending pushes up domestic expenditures, which on their turn leads to higher consumption and imports, ultimately adversely affecting the level of foreign exchange reserves. Because of the relatively high level of imports due to the structure of our economy, the outflow of hard-earned foreign exchange is huge. The higher the spending by the government of Aruba, the higher the pressure on our international reserves, as well as on the domestic price level. The latter impacts the internal value of the florin and thereby the purchasing power of the consumers. As the guardian of the florin, the CBA has and will always duly act to protect the fixed peg of the florin with the US dollar. To this end, the CBA has sufficient tools at hand to pursue a credible monetary policy. While many governments tested the effectiveness of CBA monetary policy, it would have been easier if our founding fathers had also put in place an effective legal framework that is conducive to prudent fiscal policies, those that are more in harmony with frugal monetary policies. While in recent years, legal frameworks have been established to bring back government finances to a sustainable path, it is very sad to note that an external party, that is the Dutch government, needed to exert extreme pressure to have these in place through the enactment of the Landsverordering Aruba Tijdelijk Financieel Toezicht, the LAFT. Through the LAFT, the government of the kingdom has also become the ultimate supervisor of the government of Aruba. The prime supervisor of the government of Aruba, being in the Aruban parliament, was not the initiator of these laws. What causes the failure of timely and decisive actions by our parliament to bring and maintain government finances on a sustainable path? That is a topic on itself, which I won't address on this occasion. Having the left in place, which for the first time introduced fiscal rules to reach the goal of a balanced budget, is a good start 
towards sustainable government finance, but does not guarantee good governance. However, in my opinion, a necessary precondition to reach sustainable government finances is to legally anchor good governance in public sector management. How can we further improve good governance in the public sector in a structural and effective way? The World Bank defines good governance as the manner in which power is exercised in the management of a country's economic and social resources for development. It is described as epitomized by predictable, open, and enlightened policy making, a bureaucracy imbued with professional ethos, an executive arm of the government accountable for its actions, and a strong civil society participating in public affairs, and all behaving under the rule of law. Based upon this definition, we note that there are many aspects related to good governance. However, in this presentation, I will limit myself only on the need for fiscal governance, open government data, and a national anti-corruption strategy. Fiscal governance comprises those rules, regulations, and procedures that influence how budgetary policy is planned, approved, carried out, and monitored. Consequently, fiscal governance has many dimensions, such as numerical fiscal rules, fiscal reporting, macroeconomic and fiscal forecasting, independent fiscal institutions, medium-term budgetary frameworks, performance-based budgeting, and budgeting procedures. In our 2017 report, Sustainable Government Policies, recommendation to the government of Aruba for the period 2017-2021, we have suggested different pathways for strengthening fiscal rules and fiscal institutions with the ultimate aim of achieving and maintaining sustainable public finances. Specifically, we propose the government to consider introducing a balanced budget rule. Therefore, we welcome the new fiscal norms agreed between the government of Aruba and the government of the Netherlands for the period 2019-2021. Moreover, we recommended the government to consider introducing additional fiscal rules, such as a maximum debt to GDP ratio, a golden rule for capital expenditures, and a minimum expenditure for education. In addition to safeguard appropriate coverage going forward, fiscal rules also should include off-budget fiscal activities by imposing a limit on PPP projects. Great care should also be exercised to ensure that the fiscal rules are comprehensive to prevent shifting the source of fiscal indiscipline to areas not covered. The aforementioned report as well as the 2013 report, a roadmap to fiscal sustainability in Aruba, just mentioned by Armand, are now available on the website of the CBA. In pursuing good governance, we advise the government of Aruba to fully adopt the concept of open government data. This implies that government data should be made available to the public with a view to improve transparency and accountability. Open data is grounded in the recognition that government data is produced with public funds, and therefore it should, with a few exceptions of course, be treated as public goods. The benefits of making public sector information data freely outweighs the costs. Ladies and gentlemen, by making government data available, public institutions become more transparent and accountable to citizens. Open data support public oversight of governments and help reduce corruption by enabling greater transparency. In practice, achieving these conditions prove particularly challenging given that government data are collected by numerous public entities in Aruba with their own mandates, standards, frameworks, and processes to collect and disseminate information. Furthermore, depending on the institution, the dissemination of data can be subject to the approval by a ministry in charge of the domain in which the entity operates. 
such an environment could give rise to principal agent problems when data releases don't align with the incentives of the respective ministries. Legal constraints currently also restrict data sharing across institutions and government departments. The statistics ordinance does not explicitly authorize the Central Bureau of Statistics to demand data from other government entities or institutions. These partners are therefore less compelled to share the data, often citing the need to uphold confidentiality. Internationally, on the other hand, we have made an important step on, the, on data sharing last year, as Aruba is now included in the data banks of international institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank, and has become a member of the IMF's Enhanced General Data Dissemination System, the so-called eGDDS. However, the number of available data series and their timeliness should be improved. To promote good governance in the public sector, we have advised the government of Aruba to adopt a national anti-corruption strategy. After all, corruption is the antithesis of good governance. High levels of corruption could have many negative repercussions. Corruption debilitates public finances, thereby undermining desired outcomes in, for instance, education and healthcare as a result of less available resources. Furthermore, corruption weakens government's ability to provide inclusive growth in a number of different areas. Therefore, the government of Aruba should embrace, in close co collaboration with relevant stakeholders, a holistic national anti-corruption strategy that meets international standards. This anti-corruption strategy should be founded on the principle of integrity, transparency, and accountability. As I mentioned before, policy on openness of information such as open government data could be one element of a possible anti-corruption strategy to improve transparency and accountability. Another important pillar of the anti-corruption strategy sh should be institution capacity building. Addressing corruption requires effective institutions. In this context, integrity in the public sector should be enforced by developing a cadre of competent public officials who are independent of both private influence and political in interference. Meet, moreover, the government of Aruba should strengthen public institutions that control or that advise the government, such as the cent Centrale Accountants Dienst, Algemene Rekenkamer, and the Raad van Advies. This could be achieved by ensuring their budgetary independence and securing professional staffing and leadership, as well as the necessary authorities to perform their task. In addition, a dedicated institution should be established in charge with good governance. Furthermore, the government should strengthen and introduce relevant anti-corruption laws and regulations and the strict enforcement hereof. An important measure is, for instance, the introduction of a policy for dealing with conflict of interest and legislation with regard to the financing of political parties. People empowerment should be another pillar of this anti-corruption strategy. The civil society should act as a watchdog that monitors and scrutinizes the government's actions and measures in, in fighting corruption. A whole of society culture of integrity should be fostered and education programs should be implemented, especially for the youth, to stimulate integrity and raise awareness of the risk of corruption, as well as to actively support actions to be taken by citizens to, for example, report corruption, corruption when detected. Last but not least, the Parliament of Aruba should be strengthened to be able to effectively perform its duty of supervising the work of the government. Although anti-corruption reforms can be adopted quickly, we know that time is needed to build effective institutions, to implement and to strictly enforce the anti-corruption rules and regulations set in place. Therefore, it is prudent to adopt a multi-year anti-corruption strategy comprising a number of mutually supporting programs. 
to be able to formulate and execute an anti-corruption strategy successfully, we also need information on the experience and perception of our citizens with regard to corruption. Therefore, in the last months of 2018, we have conducted a corruption perception survey in our community based largely upon the methodology applied by Transparency International. The survey included questions about the perceived level of corruption, the experience with the corruption when using services, particularly in the public sector, the experience when reporting corruption, and the need for additional anti-corruption measures. Preliminary results indicate that about 70% of those surveyed think that the problem of corruption is widespread in Aruba, while a marginal percent think there is no corruption. Also, almost 70% agree there is corruption in public institutions in Aruba. Only close to 20% disagree. Another important result among the, those, current, those interviewed indicate that more than 50% agree that the current parliamentary system contributes to cor corruption in Aruba. Another finding shows that about 60% perceive corruption as part of the business culture in Aruba. Also more than 70% agree that favoritism and corruption hamper business competition. One possible action, on possible actions, excuse me, to mitigate corruption, about 80% agree on the introduction of an integrity chamber in charge with advising on integrity policies. Above 80% agree on the introduction of legislation with regard to the financing of political parties. And more than 60% agree on the use of referendum for important decisions. The preliminary results of this survey are telling and underline the need to take, to take swift and decisive actions to counter any effort that may be conducive to corruption in the public sector. Ladies and gentlemen, in concluding, I would like to stress the importance of a sound public governance framework, not only for the government of Aruba, but also for public institutions to ensure that they are well managed and supervised. I know in the past, the government took concrete actions to introduce a corporate go governance code for public envies. However, it may not have been fully and adequately implemented, regretfully. Therefore, the CBA is working on a draft state ordinance related to corporate governance as part of its advisory role to the government. In this way, the government can promote good governance on a public sector level, which is, as I stated in my earlier remarks, a prerequisite for achieving and maintaining sustainable government finances. The gap in complying with international standards on good governance seems big and discouraging. Good governance is a common good. It is not a privilege, and it transcends generations. So we're all in the same boat called Dushi Aruba. Let's work hard on the badly needed road. And perhaps during the next symposium, we can report on the progress we have made. I thank you very much.